Well, thank you very much, Carol. Um, yeah, I was up here. I spent a lot of hours in this room um, and those right next to it. And uh, I wanted to get back in the worst way, so I drove my own car and found a parking place and got here just on time. <laughs> um, but it is certainly um, my current role is as uh, managing director of the Energy Future Coalition. Energy Future Coalition is a nonpartisan, um, nonprofit uh, group that focuses on finding um, practical middle ground solutions to energy and climate problems um, that uh, that work. And um, co-founded by uh, Boyd and Gray, who was George H. W. Bush's White House Counsel, and John Podesta, who was Bill Clinton's Chief of Staff, and uh, headed by Tim Wirth, former senator from Colorado. So there's a political pedigree there, but there's also a really uh, strong um, desire to find good middle ground policies. Among the uh, early convictions that they had in, in founding the Energy Future Coalition was that we actually did need to aim toward a clean energy future. We needed to find ways of having much less uh, environmental impact in, in general, climate uh, carbon impact in particular from our energy system going forward. And it was also clear from the very beginning that you really can't do that unless you take advantage of, unless you have access to the lavish renewable resources that we have in this country. Uh, we have, uh, you know, wind energy, solar energy, geothermal energy, um, that adds up to many times our national energy requirements if we can uh, tap the, those resources economically and move them to where they use them, get the resources to the market. So we started um, a couple of years ago a group called Americans for a Clean Energy Grid to focus in on that question. How do we develop the clean energy resources that we have and how do we move them to the market and how does it pencil? It has to work. It has to work economically. It has to work in competition with other clean energy sources that you could potentially build near the market. Uh, it has to work with cleaning up sources that aren't inherently clean. So um, we've been exploring these issues, but it was pretty clear that you needed to do some serious quantitative analysis to truly understand the dynamics. What are the costs of developing um, renewable energy and moving it to market? What are the market impacts of having an energy source that is essentially all upfront costs with a very low to zero marginal operating costs? And how does the market perceive these? So it was late last year, I guess, that we um, decided we needed to have some true experts focus in on that, those questions. And as a result of that, we um, uh, contracted with Synapse Energy Economics, a very um, distinguished group of such experts, to address those questions for us. And today we are releasing the study that, that their analysis has produced. Um, and so without any further comments on my part, I'm going to turn the microphone over to Ezra Hausman, who is uh, Chief Operating Officer of Synapse and one of the co-authors of the study, and he's sitting next to Bob Fagan, who is, uh, I suppose, the principal author of the study, um, and between them they should be able to answer any questions about it. I think we're going to actually hold the questions until, until the other panelists um, have a chance to, to go, but uh, with that, Ezra, let me hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, am I queued up here if I, no, okay, first technical snafu or, no, okay, well, uh, <laughs> we'll start. is Amory uh, here to, I know that uh, my presentation is right on the desktop there if somebody wants to double click it, uh, John, I'll just start by I'll just 
speak uh, loudly and without visual aids. Uh, Synapse is a research and consulting firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Is this on now? No? Okay. Uh, okay. That's good. So we are a research and consulting firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We provide uh, expert analysis um, and testimony and reports on issues relating to energy and environment. Um, clients include a number of state agencies, we work for state legislative committees, we work for a lot of uh, commissions, commission staff, um, state environmental groups, we uh, work with a lot of state uh, consumer advocates. We work with the federal EPA, um, we work with a number of environmental groups and foundations. And uh, this is a, it's been a great opportunity for us to work with the Energy Future Coalition and Americans for a Clean Energy Grid, because it uh, involves a lot of areas that we work on that don't, don't often get uh, analyzed in the kind of uh, comprehensive way that we were able to do in this report, which is looking at the cost of building transmission to support renewable energy development on the one hand and the market impacts of bringing uh, this very low operating cost resource onto the grid on the other. So actually looking at those in, uh, in one report is a great uh, vision that, that the Energy Future Coalition had is a great deal of work on this. Eager to get into the details. Okay. Can everybody hear all right? Mm -hmm. So um, the first piece of background is just a kind of economics 101 for uh, electricity markets, which is that electricity markets are based on uh, a dispatch, that is to say, <coughs> the units are turned on in order of the least costly to the most uh, expensive. So that when a, a very low cost resource like wind, which has no fuel cost, costs virtually nothing to operate, is available, that tends to displace the most expensive resources on the system. And that can bring down prices for the wholesale market and ultimately for consumers. This is an effect that we refer to as site or the supply-induced price effect. Uh, the Midwest region, which was the focus of this study, provides a great uh, case study for this because there is such an abundance of wind potential, which, uh, which will require some investments to bring it online. But uh, once it's available, there's a great deal of geographic diversity. There's a lot of reason to believe that it will uh, be very effective at uh, producing this effect and reducing wholesale market costs. So the question that we're addressing in the study, as I mentioned at the outset, is how does the cost of building transmission 
uh, compare to the, the price benefits of adding more wind to the generation mix. Now, to be uh, on the you know, very specific side here, we did not actually produce uh, paired examples of transmission build-outs and the winds of the wind that they would access. That's an uh, extraordinarily complicated question. Uh, there have been a number of studies in the Midwest. There's the RGOS studies, the Regional Generation Outlook study. Thank you. Um, that, uh, that has looked at that. Uh, it's been a, a topic of discussion at Eastern Interconnect Planning Council. We refer to those documents. We use wind build-outs that are consistent with those documents and transmission build-outs that, that look something like those, but um, you know, we're not claiming to have tied one with the other all that carefully. This is the one slide illustration of how our uh, dispatch analysis model works. So each of the kind of bumpy curves that you see is the supply curve that I was describing. The different colors, of course, you can't quite make out on the lines, but can uh, give you a sense of what they are. The different colors represent the different kinds of resources. At the far left, we have the lowest cost resources on a running cost basis. And if you move over toward the right, uh, as you build up the higher and higher aggregate load amounts, the cost of running those units in increases. What is being shown here in the vertical dashed line is an example load block. So load for that particular time period might have been, I think, when we get after about 65 uh, gigawatts region-wide. And so we're showing what the price would be at that load level under three scenarios. The middle line is what we are calling the base case, which is just what we uh, currently would anticipate for 2020 resources without any uh, additional effort either to retire uh, existing coal plants or to build wind. The top line is what happens if you just retire, in this case, 30 gigawatts, 12 gigawatts of coal. That's an important distinction. Uh, in this example, 12 gigawatts of coal, which tends to, re to take away those lower cost resources and increase the price of energy. The lower no line no shows the combined effect of retiring those 12 gigawatts of coal and adding adding uh, 40 gigawatts of wind to the system. So what we have in that case is a substantial decrease in the price below the base case because, again, what's setting that price are lower cost resources, the higher cost resources that push off of the base case. So that's, that's uh, in the simplest terms I can put it, the, uh, the dispatch model that we're using for purposes of this analysis. So the difference in where those lines cross the supply, the uh, demand, uh, vertical demand curve there, uh, is a change in price because of the new resource mix. This uh, price suppression effect is not something we invented. It's uh, well known. It's something that, in fact, is at the basis of the uh, analysis that the Midwest ISO did of their own multi-value projects. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, a commonly known dynamic that uh, which will show up in any kind of electricity dispatch model. Um, we ran this this uh, analysis over a range of coal plant retirement models. Now, these would be retirements in general in response to the uh, new and upcoming EPA regulations that are affecting coal economics. And the analysis showed that it's uh, better robust with that. Um, and we also, as I mentioned, we looked at, at transmission costs. I'll show you those results in just a moment, or a summary of them. And we found that um, over the full range of possible scenarios, that the price suppression effect will have a greater um, impact in terms of savings and wholesale electricity prices than the additional costs associated with transmission. And those numbers look ultimately something like 60 to 200 dollars per year for a typical residential customer who's using 1,000 kilowatt hours per month. Uh, I mentioned that uh, the transmission cost 
the transmission and wind scenarios aren't exactly matched, do you consider this to be more indicative? Oh, wow, okay, I can stop yelling now. Uh, and there will be a good recording of my conclusions or something. Um, the, uh, so these are our caveats. The electric price, we're looking uh, fairly far out on the margins here in some cases. So the electricity price effect, uh, I would say, is quite robust if we're talking about uh, small wind additions or even you know, fairly large anticipated wind additions or somewhat beyond that. Once we get into extremely large changes in the generation mix, then you have to start asking questions about how would the market respond if you do have a very large price suppression effect. Obviously, that will affect the economics of existing generators, and so it's hard to know what all the dynamics would be under those circumstances. So this is an important picture to provide context for our results. And what this shows is the breakdown of the costs that contribute to the electric bill of that typical 1,000 kilowatt hour a month customer, in this case, in the consumer's energy region. And the thing I'd like to just call your attention to is the green, I'm colorblind, so you might have to help me out here, but I think the green transmission uh, wedge there, which shows the transmission, which gets lots of attention and lots of noise, is really just about 5% of the typical electric bill. The generation piece, which is the large red wedge, is, is, is by far the lion's share of the cost of energy for a consumer. Distribution is an important fixed charge. That's the more local uh, wires piece that, uh, that makes it possible to bring power to your house. And that's, uh, I think the reason transmission gets so much attention is that it's federally regulated, that there are cost allocation issues. So, you know, you hear a lot about it, but in fact, even a significant change to that transmission component is not going to make it the most important piece of your electric bill, whereas a you know, modest change to the energy component of the bill uh, will have quite a significant impact on, on what uh, consumers have to pay every month. So when we did our transmission analysis, we did pick three different transmission scenarios. I uh, direct you to the report for details of where they came from, but they were um, uh, you know, details of the scenarios, but they came from the studies that are available from the Midwest ISO, from the uh, from the EIPC process. So um, and the advantage of that is that they've, they've been vetted by stakeholder groups. There are, there is a basis for looking at, you know, getting a reality check on our estimated costs. We didn't go out and do engineering studies ourselves in order to, uh, to cost out these transmission projects. Similarly, the wind build-out scenarios uh, are based on, on similar um, sources. Uh, in particular, the RGOS study uh, that I mentioned earlier looked at a wide range of wind uh, potential sources for the Midwest. So that was a, a good place to get some grounding in reality in terms of what the potential is. And I'll show you a map um, that goes with that in, in just a moment. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we did look at coal retirement scenarios. There's been a lot of discussion of how much coal will retire um, under the new EPA regulation. So we looked at a range, uh, in this case, 3, 12, and 23 gigawatts of uh, retirements throughout the region. So this is a uh, slide. Boy, it's a little hard to see on this little screen. But um, this is a slide that just shows you what the transmission costs adders would be for uh, the different transmission build-out scenarios in three different uh, snapshot years. So we're looking at 2015, 2025, thank you, and 2031. Uh, and it's not, so we're not throwing all this transmission on at once. We have a realistic transmission build out timeline. Uh, we're, we have a costing model in terms of how that would filter into rates. And what we see is that the range of additions on a dollars per megawatt hour basis, so that's generally what we use for wholesale market prices is between a dollar and about 10 bucks a megawatt hour increase in costs. Um, we talk mostly about cents per kilowatt hour on the retail level, so that's about a tenth of a penny to about a penny per kilowatt hour 
increase in the, uh, the wholesale cost of, of power, the power portion of your bill. Uh, the tra thank you, the transmission, right, uh, piece of your bill. So where do th what should we compare that to? Well, here's the full range of price uh, suppression effect pictures. Whoops, thank you. Um, and what we've got here is one curve for each of our coal retirement scenarios. So the uh, thin dotted line on the bottom is three gigawatts of retirement. The middle one, the dashed line is uh, 12 gigawatts and the top line is 23 gigawatts. And what you see on the vertical axis is what the average annual price suppression effect would be in dollars per megawatt hour. So when we get to about you know, 30 or 40 gigawatts of wind installed, uh, it's hard to see up there, but that's on the order of about a $20 per megawatt hour, two cents a megawatt hour savings. Uh, when we get to much larger amounts of wind, the savings can be one and a half, two times that. So it can be up to, you know, in our model, up to four cents a, a kilowatt hour. Now, again, at that point, you're getting more of a reaction from the market, so it's hard to know exactly what would happen or how long that effect would last. But I just, you know, this is the comparison. This is the range of transmission build-outs to quite an, quite an aggressive transmission build-out uh, that in 2030 would be adding about a penny per kilowatt hour or, or 10, 10 or 11 dollars a megawatt hours uh, to your bill, whereas the price suppression effect even for build-outs which are quite uh, foreseeable and probably will not have a, a major market impact, is saving twice that. So it's something like a two-to-one benefit for consumers based on these, on these factors. So in conclusion, uh, there's opportunity for uh, very large build-outs of wind in the Midwest on the basis of of fairly modest transmission enhancements, um, adding low running resources, as I showed, because of this supply curve effect will have quite a dramatic effect on the power part, which is the most important part of a consumer's electricity bill. And um, then just this last uh, point, that it, and, it, and it is, um, according to our analysis, much larger than the cost of the transmission piece. Uh, and the specific benefits um, will depend on what the contracting terms are, what the market structures are, engineering details. You know, they, we don't have perfect foresight into the 2020, or certainly not 2030 period. Um, I should add that we were somewhat, in terms of the contracting details, an important uh, point is we, we, we tried to be conservative on that. So when we looked at savings for consumers uh, in our study, we assume that half of the power, only half of the power in your electric bill would be affected by this price suppression effect because about half the power uh, would be under long-term contracts, including likely the wind power. Now, is the number half? Uh, I don't know if it's half today. I certainly don't know if it's half in 2030. It's very hard to get robust data on that, but that's a pretty good uh, first cut, uh, I believe, for the Midwest ISO region. And here's that last picture that I just wanted to mention. This uh, is really hard to see, I apologize. Uh, but essentially it shows the transmission, um, a very crude drawing of the, the transmission in the Midwest region, including what's anticipated for the MVP uh, projects and also the, the uh, areas of, the circles are areas of high wind potential. And I can tell you're, you wanna jump in and say something. Bob always wants to say something when he sees a transmission map. He uh, loves them. I think he reads them to his kids at night. No, I was just going to say that this is a this is in a public document. Uh, MISO publishes its MVP uh, report called the MVP Portfolio Report, if I'm not mistaken, and this particular picture uh, is in that report. Thanks. So I already did my conclusions, so um, going the wrong way. Okay. Thank you.
resources and how it actually fits into all of our consumer <coughs> and understanding that portion that context, which I think we often fully overlook as we hear about transmission, cost, allocation, and, and how huge and controversial those issues have been and many times we lose sight of the context. So now we're going to hear from somebody who has to deal with the whole issue of transmission, making things run, um, making them reliable day in and day out. I certainly wouldn't want this person's job at all. Uh, and probably nobody here would, so he probably deserves a hand just for having this job. Um, anyway, we're going to hear now from Joe Gardner, who is the Executive Director of Real-Time Operations for MISO, the Midwest Independent System Operator. And MISO is responsible for running the transmission grid for 11 states plus, um, uh, uh, plus Manitoba, Canada. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, there is one person in the room that wants my job. So uh, I've been doing it for a long time, and uh, I enjoy it. I, I do. I am in charge of the control center um, in Carmel as well as the one in St. Paul. We have two control centers to run the Midwest ISO or MISO, um, and I've been doing it for a long time. I can tell you that um, wind has changed our operation quite a bit over the last uh, six years. And I'll give you a little bit of a flavor for that today. So uh, I'm just going to review a little bit of history, how we got to where we are over the last five or six years, some of the impact that it's had, how we've responded to that. Um, we are in charge of not only the reliability uh, of the footprint, but we are, in, we are also trying to dispatch all the energy in the footprint in an efficient manner as possible, including wind. Um, and we've made quite a few changes in our operation to try to get there, both reliably and efficiently. I'll also talk a little bit about what we see going forward. What I'm going to tell you is what's on this slide, basically, which is that capacity and output will continue to grow. Um, congestion will continue as more wind is added. We, are, we, we could <clears throat> fairly regularly have to dispatch wind down in order to make, make sure that the transmission system is operated within limits and operated reliably. That's principally because wind has been added either A, without building more transmission, or B, um, plan plans to have transmission added are still in progress and they're not complete. And so we do have to dispatch it down a lot because it's not complete. Um, we are, as they, as they mentioned, adding multi-value projects to help mitigate this. One of the key things and key messages that the output variability of wind is something we do have to manage on a regular basis, but as more and more wind gets added in more and more places, it gets mitigated because of geographical dispersity, and we've seen that in the data. Um, we get better at it. Our tools are getting better. We've added products to help deal with this. Um, generally speaking, they're market products to make sure it's dealt with in an efficient manner. We're getting better at forecasting it. It's very important that we, do, that we are able to forecast it, and we are getting better at it. Um, we don't anticipate significant operational management issues in the next several years. Uh, an operator never says never, uh, but we don't anticipate it. And um, we'll continue to get better as time goes on. This is a picture, a little bit of, of, of the growth uh, of wind capacity in our footprint. You can just see six years ago, or just a little over five years ago, we only had about 1,000 megawatts of wind capacity in our footprint. Today we have about 11,000 megawatts of wind capacity in our footprint and we'll have about 14,000 by the end of the year. To put that in perspective, that's about 10% of our capacity. So it's a significant portion of the capacity in the footprint. If the renewable portfolio standards that the states in our footprint uh, continue the way we project them, we think we'll have about 27,000 megawatts of capacity in 2029. That's an estimate because it, it really depends on where they're put and whether they're put in windy places or non-windy places, but, but it's an estimate. We do have a lot of wind in our queue uh, that people have uh, 
come to us and said they'd like to put in, but most of it won't get built, we don't, we don't believe. This is a picture of what, how it's grown on an energy basis over the last three years. And there's, two, there's two important parts to this slide I'd like you to keep in mind. Number one, the top part is growing quite a bit, but the other important part is the summer piece, which is the valleys of each, of each year. The summer piece is not going up as fast as the peak, and that's because the, it's not as windy in the summer, and when it's not as windy, you don't get as much output. So the amount of wind we get in our summer, which happens to also be our peak season for load, it's not going up as rapidly as, the, as it is in the winter. And that is an important part. This, is, this actually looks bad because the trend is going down. And what we're looking at here is the capacity factor of wind, meaning how much per megawatt of capacity are you getting out of the plants in energy, okay? And it's going down. There's a good reason why it's going down. The wind is now being put in places where it's not as windy. So the, the more you put wind generation in places where it's not as windy, the less output you get as a function of the capacity. But this also is a reason why we can help manage it from an operational basis, because it is getting spread out. The reason it's important that it gets spread out is that it, it's very simple. The wind doesn't start blowing everywhere all at the same time, and it doesn't stop blowing everywhere all at the same time. If we had continued on the trend of putting all the wind in southwest Minnesota and northwest Iowa, which is where a lot of the original wind went, uh, we would have di a lot more difficulty managing it. It's the fact that it's getting spread out that makes it uh, manageable. Earlier I talked about the fact that the wind capacity is coming online. It's coming online uh, without necessarily having transmission investment. And that's caused us to, when lines start loading up and we realize we're going to have a reliability issue, we were having to get on the phone, call the wind plant, dispatch them down. Um, that's not in a very efficient way to manage it. And so we set off a couple of years ago to put a dispatchable product in place. Most of the new wind farms, if not all the new wind farms, are able to be dispatched. And basically the way they do that is they just turn their blades uh, on, the, on the farms themselves, and they're able to very rapidly uh, lower their output. So when we do have transmission uh, reliability issues, we can send a dispatch signal to them and ask them to lower, and we can do that at their price. So they give us an offer. How much is it going to cost them to generate? Sometimes it's negative in the, in the case of wind because they get a production tax credit, but they give us an offer, and we can precisely dispatch them to what makes sense efficiently. Um, so we get the exact amount we need at any given point in time, and the transmission system is still operated in a reliable manner. And this chart shows that. The, blue, the upper left chart shows the blue area is manual curtailments. The green area are dispatchable curtailments. And you can see as time is going on, the amount of dispatchable curtailments we're, we're getting, rather than calling them up on the phone and dispatching them down, is getting greater. We expect that to be almost all green by the end of next year or, or by this time next year. Um, the, the, the chart on the bottom right is a chart of how often can wind set price. And basically what that means is, is it transparent? When we dispatch the wind down, are we sending a price signal to the market that it was uh, done in a manner in associated with price and what the price was? And as you can see, that, that, that bottom right chart doesn't start until June of last year. That's because that's the first month that we actually put this new product in place. And as time goes on, we're actually able to see that the, that the wind resources themselves are setting the price. That, that does lots of good things because it, it, it's, it's able to be compared to other units and other resources in the area. It, it gives a price signal to loads about what, the, what it's costing to uh, deliver wholesale power in their part of the footprint. Uh, this, will con this also will continue on an upward trend. But there are, there are other issues that you gotta consider when you look at capacity factor, what kind of capacity credit can you really count on when to do, at least in our footprint in the summertime? This is a graph over the last six years of what it has done on our peak load day. Okay, now you can't look at the blue. The blue is the absolute megawatt value. You look at the green because the green line indicates the percentage of the wind online at the time. So in 2006, a little over 52% uh, of the wind was available on our peak day. Last year, a little under 50% was available on our peak day. But we've also had several years where it was less than 5%. So it, it, it's unpredictable when you look ahead into, the, into a summer exactly how much you're going to get out of it. 
Uh, I, I mentioned most of this, um, but the, the fact that we added the dispatch board admit and resources, the, the thing that things that were important about that were we're able to now dispatch the wind in an economic manner compared to all the other resources at their offer. Um, we're able to give accurate price signals. We're able to uh, get efficient congestion management. And just as important, uh, we're able to uh, mitigate any minimum generation conditions. We used to have concerns that in the middle of the night when the wind was up, we would have trouble getting underneath our load. Now that we have a dispatchable product in place, when that happens, we can just dispatch them down uh, and take care of the issue. We expect the geographic diversity to continue. Um, this is a chart that shows our queue. Although a lot of it's still in Iowa and Minnesota, there is a significant portion also uh, in our queue in Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. So we do expect the geographic uh, diversity to continue. Rapid increases in wind are really easy to manage. Uh, we can just not, when, when, when wind goes up quickly, we can dispatch the rest of the resources down. If that fails, we can actually wind, dispatch the wind down now, so that works uh, very well. Rapid decreases in wind, however, can cause economic issues sometimes, at, or I'm sorry, reliability issues sometimes, and so we have to be very careful about that, and wind forecasting is extremely important. We need to be able to predict what's going to happen in the near term, and if we get it right, we're in good shape. We're able to schedule all the other resources around what we expect the wind to do. If we don't get it right, we have to respond. There are different ways to respond. We can respond with quick start units. We can respond with operating reserves. To date, we've never had to go to the, to the step of, of actually having to uh, use operating reserves to mitigate it. That would be an indication that we'd have to be uh, careful or, or more quick, careful and change our practices. Um, the day ahead wind forecast there, we're getting better. It's hard to see on this chart, but we've actually gotten about a half a percent better over the last few years, and, and our four-hour ahead forecast there is also getting better. We expect to continue to get better at it as well. I think those are the, the main points I wanted to uh, take. Just to leave you with, uh, we continue to get better. We gain operational experience over time. Geographic uh, diversity makes a big difference and it's making making everything manageable uh, we're get, we can, we're continuing to improve our market incentives uh, we're continuing to improve our tools and we're learning from others uh, in uh, not not just the US but all in the rest of the world because there are other significant um, footprints that have a lot of wind Uh, since we know that in certain parts of, of Europe um, that there is so much wind and solar and a variety of other renewables that have, that have been intermittent resources that they have been successfully putting on their grid. So it makes sense for all of us to be sharing that. Uh, there are, as, as John mentioned at the outset, there are um, an abundance of renewable resources in this country. We are blessed with them figuring out how to best utilize them in a cost-efficient, reliable way is, is something that has been of, of concern and of obviously great interest uh, to many players across the country. And so today we also want to take a little bit of a look at that because, as we know, while we've been hearing about wind, there are also important renewable resources in the form of biomass in terms of a whole variety of water power technologies in terms of geothermal and, and also solar, which is, uh, again, a family of, of resource technologies. And so this afternoon, we're going to hear from Fred Morse, who is a senior advisor with Abengoa. And Abengoa is a major developer of utility central power scale um, uh, concentrating solar. And Fred also uh, is the chair of CIA, the Solar Energy Industries Association, USP division. Fred? Thank you very much. I decided to do something different today, so I have props. Um, I'm going to talk about, following the request, the abundance, affordability, and reliability and made in America of concentrating solar power. My first prop, magnifying glass getting this in. It's, they let me in with this. My thermos bottle and my American flag. So 
Um, all of you have done this when you were kids. You burn the hole in a piece of paper, right? You can very easily generate extremely high temperatures by concentrating the energy of the sun and making steam. The next slide shows the technologies that do that. Uh, and they're called concentrating solar power, and the most popular ones, the one in the middle, the power tower, the one on the upper left, the trough. And what these technologies do is they generate temperatures high enough to run a conventional steam turbine. And they do it flawlessly and perfectly. Um, the next slide shows you the, the resource. Unlike the wind, which is centered a lot in the Midwest, this, solar re this resource is centered in the Southwest. And solar energy comes in two flavors comes from the sun as direct beam. It hits our messy, dirty atmosphere and gets diffuse. And we could only concentrate beam radiation. Try to concentrate anything with this on, a, on an obscure day, and it doesn't work. Um, but the Southwest has got mountains, cities, military bases. When you filter all of those out, you're left with those few little bright spots which you say, oh, there's nothing left there. But there's 87,000 square miles of, in quotes, empty land. If you're an environmentalist, it ain't, it ain't empty. But it's land that could be available for large solar thermal power plants. They're 87,000 square miles, which, if used, would generate multiples of the US. So I've answered the first point, is it, is it abundant? It is. Now this. Let's assume you have to work tonight and you cannot think straight without a cup of coffee, and you cannot boil water in your office, so what do you do? The answer is you put more water in your pot in the morning, you make a cup of coffee, and you put the other one in here. So what do you do with a solar power plant? Make the solar field bigger and store some of that energy. The next slide talks about that. So what you do is during the daytime, you generate electricity by making steam, and you put some of the excess energy into huge insulated tanks. You store the thermal energy. If you think battery, you're not listening to me. It's thermal energy. And so at night, when the sun goes down, you simply pour the thermal energy out of the thermos. You make steam. And the steam turbine does not know that night happened. So while we talk about wind, which is variable, solar is also variable. But with thermal storage, it is less so. The next slide shows you Phoenix in the summer and in the winter. The yellow is the sun. It happens to peak in the middle of the day, which all of you know it does. But the demand peaks in the afternoon. If you've ever been in Phoenix in August, they spray people who want to eat outside instead of the heaters that we have in the winter. It's very hot. And so what we can do is we can collect the energy in the daytime and deliver it when they need it. And in the winter, they only need the energy in the morning. Everyone wakes up, turns everything on, and they do the same at night. So the next slide, uh, which you'll have trouble seeing, but I'll tell you what it is, it shows that there are about eight or nine projects working in the US, some as long as 25 years. They work reliably. We heard about how wind is sometimes there at peak time, sometimes not. These plants, 100% capacity factor during peak demand, which if you are uh, my colleague Joe, he likes that, or would like that. Um, so the next slide shows you five new plants that are being built now. These exist only, O-N-L-Y, because of the Federal Loan Guarantee Program and the Investment Tax Credit. Those two policies have allowed these 1.3 gigawatts of new projects to be built. They will come online in the next two years. They are, to your no surprise, in California, Arizona, and Nevada, the sunny southwest of the US. The next slide shows a picture of the power tower going up at Crescent Dunes in Nevada. The next slide, uh, which is really a stunning one if you could see it, are three towers being built by Bright Source Energy for almost 400 megawatts. The next slide is an artist view of Solana, 280 megawatt, three square miles. Those of you who know New York City, 
That's three central parks. So it is big. Uh, and if you look in the middle, and what you're looking at is 30 years of fuel piled up around that power plant. The next is a picture taken by Representative Gosar, who flew over it two weeks ago, and you see the very large thermal storage tanks, the white ones at the top. By the way, it's two per football field, so that's the scale. Uh, the white ones are insulated. The ones that just have rings, the, the sides haven't been built yet. You can see the troughs um, being built. Okay, now this. I have to wave the flag. Made in America. Um, the Southwest has the sun, but the bits and pieces that make up Solana come from the next slide across America. This is the supply chain. 70 companies in 26 states are making the pumps, the tubes, the boil joints, the components that make this power plant. And what I said, that solar field, we heard earlier, there's a very high upfront cost and a very low operation cost, at least once you pay the debt off. So what you're looking at is basically the fuel source for these solar power plants. And they are made in America. The next slide shows a picture of the assembly of the mirrors, uh, highly automated, but yet almost 100 people manage to, to get the high quality that's needed there. So uh, next slide. So America wins by developing a domestic energy resource. It adds to our energy security. It's reliable. We have another resource. Uh, it generates clean energy, no greenhouse gas emissions, like zero and no other harmful emissions, uh, more jobs per megawatt than coal and gas. The five plants I showed you have already 5,000 people at work building them, and when they're built, there'll be over 300 people with lifetime jobs, high-quality jobs, and several thousand jobs across America making the plants. Solana is over 70% made in America, and Mojave over 90% made in America. The last question I was asked to address was affordable, and that was a bit more difficult. Next slide. Um, I think it is affordable thanks to the two policies I mentioned. The loan guarantee, which is a loan, like pay it back. Well, if you have a mortgage, see what happens, happens if you don't pay it back. Not nice things. These are loans that will get paid back. Um, but, they, and, but they do make CSP affordable today. Now, conventional sources of energy, coal started in 1830, and it cost a lot of money per kilowatt hour. As it got to the massive scale that we have in this country, where it's over half of our energy supply, the price came down, and with the subsidies it had. Same thing with gas, started high, massive increase in scale, price dropped. Wind and PV are doing the same thing, only faster and with less public support. And CSP, which is the youngest of these, is at the beginning of the learning curve, and I believe that another decade of federal support, and it too will be competitive. My last slide is my conclusion, and that is, I think that the world, the country needs all the wind, all the PV, all the geothermal it could get. I do believe that the more wind and PV that's added to the grid, with its variability, the, the greater the value of CSP with storage will be because it can help prevent dispatching down those resources. So with a little more federal support uh, on the loan guarantee and the investment tax credit, I think the outlook for CSP is very strong. America will have another competitive clean energy source, and we will have a cleaner energy future. Thank you. A lot, I think, well understood up here with regard to the whole role of concentrating solar power and the role that it really can play and the whole, um, the, the very important role of the storage that is built into this very, very important and, again, very abundant resource. So for our uh, last wrap-up speaker here who can kind of tie things up in a very neat bundle because of the very unique 
uh, experience that he uh, has had uh, over over many many years is Jim Hecker, who is the uh, counsel and advisor to Wires, uh, which is the working group for investment in reliable and economic electric systems, and and of course Jim is the former chairman of FERC of the Federal uh, Energy um, uh, Regulatory Commission. And we've had the pleasure to work with Jim and his wires group on looking at exploring transmission transmission issues and the many um, and the many questions that need to be discussed as part of that over the last couple of years. Jim, thank you, Carol. Um, I I appreciate the invitation from EESI, and uh, and I want to express my. Uh, uh, admiration, appreciation to John Jemison and the Americans for Clean Energy Grid and the study that's been done by, uh, by Synapse. Uh, however, I couldn't disagree more with the assertion that transmission gets too much attention. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's only fair to say that uh, five or six years ago, nobody was paying attention to the grid, uh, that as a nation, we had spent about uh, a quarter century under-investing in transmission. Uh, we had, uh, not just in nominal terms, but in real terms. Uh, and we've been playing catch-up since about 2003. Um, the, the, the outlook is, uh, is uh, getting brighter. Uh, I did have one Wisconsin commissioner tell me he was suffering from transmission fatigue. Uh, primarily because American transmission companies have been so successful in building facilities in that state. But um, uh, we have a long way to go. We have a lot of challenges. And um, uh, the fact that uh, people don't pay attention to infrastructure uh, and, uh, and as certainly something as, uh, 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 as, as basic uh, but which elicits a lot of interesting uh, responses from landowners as electric transmission. Um, we have, uh, you know, we have our, 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 our work uh, uh, cut out for us. The importance of this particular study, and, and uh, let me focus on that a little bit, is, uh, is that um, uh, renewable energy um, and the prospect of greater solar and, and wind resources biomass and geothermal, as Carol points out, um, <clears throat> has refocused everybody's attention on the grid uh, because the lavish resources, as John says, that, that we have uh, in, in the area of wind and solar happen to be located where there aren't a lot of customers. So we have to deliver that uh, hundreds, in some cases perhaps even thousands of miles uh, through the electrical system which was built for a completely different purpose and designed differently. Uh, and, um, and, and it was built, a good portion of it was built uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, so um, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what is, the, is the significance of, of the transmission system to this discussion uh, is, is principally that we can uh, interconnect these renewable resources, deliver them to market, uh, and we can do it in a way that overall benefits consumers, uh, doesn't burden them. Um, you will hear the story, I've heard it plenty of times, that we, we, uh, we talk about transmission and, and uh, uh, the danger is that we're going to overbuild it, that we're going to saddle consumers with a massive bill for facilities that they don't benefit from. Um, and uh, I can tell you that, um, I can tell you that uh, uh, federal regulators and state regulators are focused on that issue like a laser. To improve the transmission planning process uh, and to ensure that we have reliable energy uh, that gets delivered over a transmission system that's big enough but not any bigger than we need to deliver these resources. Um, uh, we all, I think, want a 21st century economy, a 21st century infrastructure, a 21st century uh, 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 grid. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an issue that, um, 
that I think uh, certainly weighs on my mind, but uh, it's it, it's one that uh, that has its uh, that has its uh, 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 barriers uh, to fulfillment. Uh, the the uh, federal policy in electricity um, since not just since I was on the FERC, but going back to uh, PERPA and, uh, and uh, the Natural Gas Policy Act in the 70s has been competition. It's been taking essential facilities like uh, interstate natural gas pipelines and electric transmission systems and making them open access so that all resources can compete. Um, uh, I think uh, we do have a clean energy future if we can deliver it, uh, but uh, renewable energy is going to have to uh, prove itself and, uh, and justify support for it uh, in the market. Uh, and what is that market based on? It's, it's based on an interstate grid uh, that provides the deliverability for those resources. Um, I think, uh, I think as, as I mentioned early on, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, supply-induced price effect, or SIPE, well, I, I just came up with my own acronym. It's called the Transmission-Induced Market Effect, or TIME. And uh, if you have adequate transmission, you can have a real market. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's important that... Uh, that uh, we began to view, begin to view transmission as an enabler. Uh, it's an enabler of technology development. Uh, it's an enabler of different sources of energy. Uh, and it'll, it allows consumers uh, the benefit of lowest cost resources. Uh, and the Synapse study, um, I think, is, is really quite insightful in saying that um, uh, there is going to be a, a, uh, um, a large, a significant price reduction if we can bring on uh, the mass of renewable resources that we have in the middle of the country. Uh, and that, that scenario doesn't change even if we have to do a significant build out of additional transmission. Uh, I think that's very, uh, a very important story uh, to tell. Transmission is an economic lever. Uh, you get a small investment and you get a, a, a big benefit. Uh, it's a job creator. Uh, my own group, WIRES, has done a, a study, which you can find on our website, and I think I have the preface to it out, outside, that shows that just manufacturing and uh, constructing uh, the amount of electric transmission we are likely to need over the next 20 years which is about, amounts to about $300 billion, will provide 150 to 200,000 full-time equivalent jobs uh, annually between now and that end date. That is a big contribution uh, to this economy in an environment where 200,000 jobs uh, a month is, is a big deal. So, um, uh, uh, I, I, I think my, my message is that uh, a transmission can deliver a real immediate uh, cost benefits to consumers, can reduce their energy costs. But the story doesn't end there, and, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that it's not just the price suppression effect of, of renewable energy uh, in the marketplace but it's also the markets, the com competition uh, among all resources uh, that transmission provides. Uh, it's, uh, it's the uh, uh, reduction in emissions that transmission provides. It's resource source diversity and an increase in reliable service and reliability, uh, which becomes more and more important since we are living in an electron guzzling very reliability sensitive uh, digital economy. Uh, we have all these gadgets around our houses that, uh, that love electricity, even at night when you think you've shut them off. So we, uh, we, uh, we've come to rely on transmission perhaps without really 
uh, knowing it. And um, over the next 20 years or so, um, uh, we're going to have uh, an electricity economy that's going to be more reliable, it's going to be cheaper, uh, it's going to be cleaner, uh, and, uh, and it's not going to happen unless we have a stronger, more extensive electric transmission system. Uh, that's the simple truth of it. Uh, thanks. And a uh, good combination, a good way to, to um, uh, put the various pieces together that we heard about today. We have access to some really terrific experts. So now is your chance to ask some questions if anybody's got any. And if you just identify yourself, please. Actually, that really fits into another briefing, but as opposed, I mean, that deserves its own, it is kind of its uh, whole own topic, um, and I would submit that that is a very important piece of the picture, just as, as this is a very important piece. But if other people want to take a crack at the question, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I just like, I, I mean, I, I understand your question, and it's a really good one. And I, and, I, and I don't think the people who advocate for, a, for strengthening the transmission system are automatically should be regarded as opponents of demand response, energy efficiency, microgrids. Uh, these are all going to be uh, components of a very flexible, more resilient electricity system in the future. I, and and uh, it may not be exactly what we're talking about this afternoon, but, but it does fit in. I, I agree with Carol. Uh, yeah, it takes into account the operating cost, which is typically what's used as a to drive dispatch, is fuel and um, variable operations and maintenance. Yeah. So mo most owners of wind generators would recover more than just the operations and maintenance cost for their units in order to be economically viable, such as capital recovery and finance charges. Who compensates those wind generators for those costs, and how are those? Um, what is the source of revenue for for those costs in the public? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. So uh, you're absolutely right that nobody's going to build a wind generator and get paid nothing <laughs> or less than they need for their energy. So um, the vast majority of wind that's built in the United States is built, and uh, at least a, a large percentage of the output, if not all of it, is pre-sold under long-term contracts. So the wind power itself would not be subject to this price suppression effect. That doesn't mean that the effect doesn't happen because the wind power is bid into the market. It's dispatched at zero price even though the actual cost that's paid by the load serving entity that buys the wind power is going to cover the cost of the wind resource. Uh, the way we accommodated that in our model, um, I, th I hope I mentioned, uh, is that we assumed that the price suppression effect uh, covers about half of the uh, the energy in a consumer's electric bill. So uh, the wind power and some other power would be purchased under long-term contracts that would not be subject to that effect. Was 
buildings downtown that are all roughly the same height. There's no, there's no sun shadow there. And so one of the things I've been pushing as a candidate is we really ought to be getting a lot of solar on those roofs that would help uh, uh, make us somewhat safer when there's grid overload. And I just figured I've got all you experts here and perhaps you can see if this really is a good issue for me to be pushing and how practical or impractical or difficult it might be in the short and long term. It's a good idea, do it. I mean, we should cover all of our rooftops with photovoltaics and use it on site. It just makes sense. So it should be done. But you also have to keep in mind that night happens and clouds happen. And people don't like their computers to stop when a cloud goes by. They will get agitated. So I think you need everything. I think you need to generate as much as you can on site and you also need to have the ability to bring in other resources um, and organizations like MISO know how to balance all that so everything stays online. But you certainly should promote that, I think. I guess I would just add that um, I grew up in D.C. I know that it gets hot and sunny in the summer and in the electric industry I know that the prices can get quite high. And one of the benefits that has to be taken into account uh, with that kind of a resource is that it's producing maximum power at the time when the prices are the highest. So you don't want to be comparing the cost of that power to sort of an average cost. You want to make sure you're looking at this, this peak power price. problem last summer when there were transformers in the different parts of the city blowing out and like all of New Street was out of business for quite a number of hours. And when I went to the hearing on that, they said it was because, I thought it said it was because of overload. Would having our own local solar help reduce that overload or is that a different kind of thing? Um, without knowing PEPCO's system, but um, my guess is that you'd still need the same infrastructure in place uh, to serve the load when the sun wasn't out. So I don't know that you, you would eliminate all your all your overload issues. They just might not occur as often. Probably, but. It, Foundation. The distributed generation question kind of got the silent treatment, but I'm going to ask about distributed energy storage anyway. Um, it seems like it's going to be some sort of a game change, whether it's an enabler for the, for the intermittent um, energy technologies, or it could be a, a cost for transmission investment if we're indeed going to have any um, small scale electric storage or any electric vehicle on the market. So, what are you? Um, particularly the transmission folks, what are you doing to prepare for um, a potential expansion of these distributed energy? I guess the, the first thing is that a lot of times is that people will get electric vehicles, for example, and charge them at night. Um, and then a lot of people hope that's the outcome. but. You really want to try to drive that with rate structures and metering that will enable that as well. Um, so I think you have to combine all that together. If all you do is add them and they're not incentivized to do it at the proper time, then we still have to add other other uh, vehicles to serve to serve that load. You know, just to follow up, transmission system planners pay a lot of attention to the patterns of load. And they look at that sort of stuff and they say, well, how might the patterns of load change in a world in which there's a lot more distributed, uh, distributed storage technologies, for example? They look at that. They examine that. You know, oftentimes in the near term, one of the, one of the uh, answers for the near term is, well, the patterns are going to start to change, but it's not something that we're going to need to worry about the next three to four years. It's not like they're going to dismantle the transmission system if all of a sudden we have a lot more distributed storage technologies. It's not going to help. They will work together is, is the short answer. There's going to be times when the distributed uh, technologies are going to provide a lot of the energy. There's going to be times when those technologies may not be able to provide as much of the energy and there's going to be greater reliance on the greater grid, which will include 
solar, wind, and conventional resources. So it, it all fits together. The system is planned and dispatched holistically. So you just have to be careful to not try to you know, look at one thing. Same goes with, with PV. I mean, local PV makes a lot of sense. And sure, it's going to help unloading on some hot days. But at the same time, you don't plan the system you know, for that one period. You plan it for all periods. I just wanted to comment, I think with regard to looking at distributed uh, uh, energy and storage, actually the issue around storage and also in terms of looking at greater electrification in the transport sector and what that could mean for storage and you know, with regard to thinking about the grid, those are issues that we're planning to address in upcoming EESI briefings. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay, there. Uh, let's start in the back and we'll work our way down. Yeah. My name is Eric with Public Citizens Energy Program. This question is from, it's probably from Mr. Morris. Um, you, give, you give a lot of credit to these new large-scale projects in the Southwest to the, to the federal policies such as loan guarantees and things of that nature. I'm curious though because the, pr the problem with a policy such as this is how do you eventually determine that you've reached an economy of scales and that prices have gone down enough that such federal aid is no longer needed? You, you'll never get a completely honest answer from manufacturers who say, hey, we want to you know, kind of ratchet down your subsidy at this point. What's the best way to craft such loan guarantee and subsidy policies such that it's very clear how they will be ratcheted down and how it will be determined that that aid is no longer needed? It's a good question. If you have a feed-in tariff, that becomes very important because a feed-in tariff is a price that's set at some time and then you have to keep adjusting it as the technologies improve. Um, with the loan guarantee, it's basically a loan. A, you, um, a developer will compete to sell um, a product to a utility. The price will be uh, negotiated, usually quite low, because the utility has a lot of other options, like gas and so on. A price is fixed. And then the federal loan guarantee simply provides the debt portion. The companies provide the equity. So as the technology drops in price, you can either build a larger plant, the dollars per megawatt will go down, and I think that that happens automatically. The grant is a different issue because that's essentially an upfront buy-down, and that would have to be uh, looked at and studied to see what is the appropriate amount. You recall it was once 10 percent, and then in um, 05 it was raised to 30 percent to sort of allow these larger projects to get started and come down the learning curve. So uh, the policy has to be adjusted. The industry is focused on cutting costs dramatically because there is very cheap natural gas out there in a rather significant amount. So that's known. I think the policies just need to be carefully watched. Yeah. Um, this is Carmen, I'm going to ask you about others. Um, I just wanted if you took a look at the increasing for Um, the, the short answer is we did uh, look at the planning reserve margin associated with uh, uh, any particular scenario, and we were a little bit conservative. It was a little bit high. Um, uh, we didn't look specifically at flexibility issues, which uh, planning reserve margin can serve as a proxy for whether or not you have enough flexibility on the grid, but we didn't get into the weeds. Part question. First part is, what are we doing to get closer to actually uh, getting the uh, the siting and permitting done in a in a reasonable time frame for uh, just for transmission? Secondly, uh, the second part, uh, have we figured out how to move pays for transmission, and what is the latest thinking on that? And third, what's the appetite of the private sector for funding transmission? And what is the appetite of the public sector for partnering in that funding? 
Well, I hope everybody brought their sleeping bags. That's a big question. <laughs> um, uh, on on siting, um, uh, we have um, uh, there are lots of different things going on. As you as you know. Uh, the states are principally responsible for siting these facilities, and although FERC has what they call backstop siting authority under 216 of the Federal Power Act, uh, it is not authority that's ever been exercised and is, in my view anyway, unlikely to ever be exercised. But, uh, uh, and with respect to, uh, and you will know this being at USDA, the uh, uh, projects, federal projects, particularly in the West that, that affect or cross uh, federally owned, federally protected lands um, that are managed by BLM, uh, Forest Service, other, other uh, such agencies, uh, they are responsible for, uh, for, citing those, uh, for citing those projects and uh, for protecting other federal, federally protected resources. Uh, species, wild and scenic rivers, etc. cetera. Um, uh, the Department of Energy uh, in this administration is, has been doing uh, something a little unusual. They've created something called a, a rapid response team, uh, which uh, under the leadership of one of the special advisors to the secretary uh, has been looking at a series of specific projects and trying to expedite uh, these are projects on federal lands and, and trying to facilitate, I guess is the right word, uh, the consideration and environmental reviews and permitting processes by the multiple federal agencies involved. And uh, there are eight or nine in lots of these big uh, uh, regions that, that become involved in, in, these, in these processes. Uh, siting is a, a very, very tough issue. Uh, it, it's uh, a tough in heavily populated areas in the east. It's equally tough in the west where the federal government owns a lot of property. Uh, uh, it, procedures uh, need to be crafted that will make environmental review under NEPA uh, 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 more efficient, uh, that will get agencies of government both state and federal using the same kinds of criteria uh, and being responsive to the same kinds of timelines. Uh, that is really easy to say and incredibly difficult to do. Um, uh, so citing is going to continue to be a very, very uh, tough nut to crack and I don't uh, anticipate that the Congress is at any time soon going to decide to preempt the state's authority in that area, and it's just not going to happen. Um, what was the last question? second part was, uh, have you decided how to pay for oh. Cost allocation. Well, maybe you ought to have dinner sent in as well. Um, we, we uh, uh, wow. Uh, cost allocation is a, a very, very difficult area. It really, the basic issue is who pays for these big, these big facilities. And you look at the way the grid operates, um, uh, uh, the transmission system's like a big lake. You know, you, you put electrons in and people are taking, taking it out at different locations. Uh, it's very difficult to, to decide who the beneficiaries of any major uh, addition or upgrade to the system is at any particular time. Um, but uh, 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 the, the FERC, after some trial and error, has put out uh, a, a, uh, a rule called Order 1000, uh, which basically says that the uh, beneficiaries of a transmission investment uh, uh, must uh, pay the cost roughly commensurate with the benefits that they receive. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult calculus, and as you might expect, uh, there is uh, resistance of people who think that um, transmission costs should be very narrowly assigned uh, to cost causers, that is, the, the, the generators that interconnect to the system. If we did that with wind, for example, 
it would be it would be a bad news for for the wind industry um, but since you know we are we are all taking uh, electrons out of that big lake uh, probably in most cases the beneficiaries are, are fairly broad part of the of, of the consumer <laughs> base so um, FERC is going to do this on a case-by-case -case basis based on the principle of beneficiaries pay and um, and, I, and I think that helps enormously I should add that in in the case of uh, the Midwest ISO which is the subject of, of uh, synapses study um, the the uh, the uh, cost of uh, multi-value projects that are going to be built in that in that region uh, will be shared across the region same thing is true for s projects above a certain voltage in the southwest power pool same thing is true for projects in New England under the New England ISO same thing is true in in Texas uh, the electric reliability council of Texas uh, one one reason Texas is so successful is because they decided early on that they had all this wind in West Texas they had all this load in East Texas and everybody was going to benefit if if we could get transmission built and so everybody every all all load tends to pay um, anyway that uh, that's pro I probably ought to stop there before everybody falls asleep uh, just in case anybody's not quite asleep yet I'll just to add a, another word for that, um, you, you accused me of, of saying that uh, people don't pay enough attention to transmission, and I appreciate that. I stand corrected. What I should have said is people pay a whole lot of attention to the cost of transmission mm -hmm. and not enough attention to the benefits of transmission, and I think this cost allocation issue is a big reason for that. Uh, the MVP projects are extraordinarily uh, craftily uh, designed, this whole uh, this whole uh, cadre of projects because the uh, benefits for every state exceed the costs so that really helped them uh, help the, I think uh, you know the, the whole Midwest region get that package uh, to get some acceptance and it was still controversial even though each of those and I you know they're probably hundreds of transmission enhancements that are clearly cost-effective uh, that would provide multiple benefits around the country that are not going forward because of these cost allocation issues so it's it's extremely important um, even though the societal benefits are just incontrovertible and you know we talk about beneficiary pays but it's prospective idea of who the beneficiaries are that's quite difficult I mean you, you tell you uh, bring up an analogy to a lake I, I bring up an analogy to the federal highway system if you had a beneficiaries pay test before you ever were able to build a highway, you wouldn't have a, a highway system because who would have anticipated, you know, who the beneficiaries are going to be? I mean, you know, it's McDonald's, right? I mean, who knew uh, who the beneficiaries of the highway system would be? I mean, and, and on the electric system as well. Is it the producers of energy? Is it the consumers? Is it the people who are going to build the resources that are going to take advantage of that? All the economic benefits will be spread around all of these regions. I mean, it's, it's an extremely difficult. Uh, area to to address I think that's an enormously important policy issue because the benefits are unquestionable the cost effectiveness is unquestionable in many cases but this question of cost allocation does get in the way of development I don't have very much to add I mean I'm not, I try to stay out of that planning stuff <laughs> I, I, uh, I kind of deal with the hand up, not look for ten years, okay. too much. Um, are there any last comments? Okay, we'll take one more question. Hi, uh, Doug Vine, the Center for Energy and Climate Solutions. Um, I just have a question about: Has anyone looked at non the non-competitive market as a competitive market? Pretty central to this this idea of the the cost savings from coal retirements and wind addition? The effect that we are identifying is specific to restructured, you know, which might refer to as competitive electricity markets. Some people may agree or disagree about that. But um, 
So th that is that's the effect that we're looking for. Uh, yes, absolutely. Other people have um, have looked at the effects in uh, more vertically integrated markets, and then you'd have to be looking at the uh, the benefits and the cost effectiveness of the resources more on an average cost basis. So that's that's really a different kind of analysis. And in many regions, um, that you know there clearly are uh, beneficial resources, but it's a, it's a different different issue. Very, very much. Terrific job. A lot of information. Uh, the presentation will be on EESI's website, and uh, and there will be a video up in a few days too. And if you want to get a hold of speakers, either let you know, either talk to them now or let us know. We'll try to keep them in touch. So thank you all very, very much.